Good afternoon, my friends. This is the Grim Flare. Hope you're doing very well today. As for myself, I'm in a great mood. Thank you for asking. My three-year-old daughter just played me a concert she sang. She was accompanying me on, um, accompanying herself, rather, on the toy piano. Very, very nice. You love to hear it. So I'm in a wonderful mood. And my mood's about to get even better, because I'm about to show you something really cool. We are featuring Yawgmoth Thran Physician on this time for the first time ever. Yawgmoth Combo in Modern, a super, super cool deck uh, brought to us by the Spice Master, Connor Smith. Connor, a very generous supporter, both with direct donations and with Of The Veil tier Patreon membership. We do love to see that. This one is for you, Connor. Thank you so very much. Connor is a big proponent of Off The Beaten Path decks, um, often combo decks and or decks that can generate loops. If that's something I could uh, observe about Connor, it would be that most of the decks that he brews or tweaks or has interests in has the ability to establish some loops. And for those of you who don't know, Yawgmoth Combo is very much one of those decks. So let's take a look at that. I'll explain it for those who don't know how the deck operates. Yawgmoth Thran Physician is kind of a mid-rangey value bomb, maybe not quite as strong as some of the very top-tier pure mid-range value bombs at the 4-drop slot, but he's up there. He's not that far behind. And when you build around him, suddenly he is an insane value engine and a potentially game-winning combo piece. So 2-4, protection from humans, that's cool. People tend to forget about that. You can use that to your advantage. And 2 black and discard a card to proliferate. Honestly, doesn't seem to come up all that much in this deck from my limited experience, but it is an ability that he has. However, the middle ability is where Yawgmoth really earns his keep and his infamous reputation. The cost? Pay one life, sacrifice another creature. The ability? Put a minus one, minus one counter on up to one target creature and draw a card. So what happens here in a vacuum? Like, forget about our specific shell. In a vacuum, you can sacrifice your worst creature, and you have to pay a life, and in return you get to kill an opponent's X1 and draw a card. So, that's a reasonable enough value exchange, and if you get things to line up, yeah, you could see you really, you know, taking over the game with something like that. But, that's not the low ceiling that we are aiming for. Instead, we are building around this four of play a set of Yawgmoth, and the main way in which we're doing so is with 11 undying creatures, 4 Young Wolf, 4 Strangle Root Geist, and 3 Garalf's Messenger. This exact 75, by the way, has 5 and 0'd twice in the recent past, so we are just kind of following the lead of the experts here, although there was some wonderful discussion in my Discord, shout out to those people, about including Aether Vile, about including a card like Caustic Caterpillar, lots of good ideas, but at the end of the day, we did decide to just follow the most recent 5 and 0. In any case, how does the Undying stuff work with Yawgmoth? Well, let's say you have a Young Wolf and a Strangle Root Geist. You can put a minus one, minus one counter on whichever one already has a plus one, plus one counter, if it has already, um, if Undying has already kicked in once, or if neither one does, you can choose not to target either because it's a minus one on up to one target creature. But let's pretend that one of them has a counter. So let's say that Strangle Root Geist is a 3-2 because Undying has already triggered once. Meanwhile, Young Wolf has just entered the battlefield as a 1-1. So you can activate Yawgmoth. You pay a life, you'll put the minus one, minus one counter on Geist, which will return it to a 2-1. It'll basically erase Undying. And therefore, if it dies again, Undying will kick in again. That's how plus one, plus one, and minus one, minus one counters work when they're applied to the same creature. So again, Yawgmoth's ability will put the counter on Geist, returning it to normal, and then we will sacrifice Young Wolf. So Young Wolf will die, Undying will trigger, Young Wolf will come back as a 2-2. Meanwhile, we get to draw a card. Then you will do the exact same thing, but in reverse. So you'll activate Yawgmoth again, minus one, minus one, the wolf returning it to its ETB state, and then sacrificing Geist, who again, having been reset to its ETB state, will come back as a 3-2. You get to draw another card. So with that loop established, you can draw as many cards as you're willing to pay one life for. But it gets better than that. If one of those cards that's undying is instead a Garal's Messenger, you can kill the opponent outright, all at instant speed, in a pretty difficult to interrupt loop. And even if they do interrupt it, you'll end up well ahead on cards. So... If you just do the exact loop I described, but with one of them being Garal's Messenger, every time you complete the loop, 
of sacrificing one and minusing the other and then inverting that, doing it again, you will have paid two life and your opponent will lose two life because a Garal's Messenger ETB token, uh, trigger will have gone on the stack. Therefore, if your life total was higher than the opponent's life total, you will kill them. Again, if they can't interrupt it or they can't burn you out in response or whatever. Um, so that's, that's the kill. That's the combo kill. If you have more life total than the opponent and you have Messenger plus one other undying creature plus the Ogmoth, you can kill them outright. If you have two Messengers, forget about it. Their life total can be much higher than yours. You can still loop the Messengers and kill them if you have several life points to play with. So that is how the deck combos off and kills the opponent. And note that all of the core components of the combo, Yogmoth himself and the 11 undying creatures, they all have ways to generate value in the face of removal or just having entered the battlefield. Strangle Root Geist in particular is very good at pressuring the opponent because uh, it can attack their planeswalkers or it can attack their life total. Garal's Messenger does not even need to attack to pressure their life total, so these are ways to play a fairer game while you're working toward the combo, and to stay ahead on the life total so that when you do find the combo, you can actually kill your opponent with it. Alongside the combo pieces, we have four Birds of Paradise, four copies of Wall of Roots, and two Gilded Geese as ways to really power out these cards ahead of schedule. Wall of Roots in particular is worth looking at because we are a Chord of Calling deck, and we're also an Eldritch Evolution deck. Wall of Roots is really good with both because as a two drop, it can be evolved into Yawgmoth in a way that the one drops cannot. So that's part of why it's good. And alongside Court of Calling, Wall of Roots basically produces two mana each turn that you are able to cord because you can put the minus so minus one counter on it, add green mana, but the uh, mana dork itself will stay untapped and therefore can still be tapped toward Convoke for Chord of Callings. So we've got a nice Monodork suite, and as mentioned, we've got 4-H of Evolution and Chord of Callings. So we have a lot of consistency in the combo between the ability to tutor for it and the fact that, you know, you find your first Yawgmoth, you're going to be drawing a handful of cards under most circumstances. So it's really easy to fight through interaction, keep assembling the combo, and maybe, alternatively, your opponent has to dedicate so much of their resources to stopping the combo that you get to win with like a good, honest, undying um, beatdown plan, which does happen a lot with this deck, too. We are a tutor deck. Uh, as usual, we will be tutoring often, but not always for the missing combo pieces. We've got some one of hate bears that are really fun to tutor for as well. Zulaport Cutthroat, actually not as much of a hate bear as it is a coup de gras for the combo. Um, if you have Zulaport Cutthroat added to any of the loots that I just mentioned, you can actually just kill the opponent outright. You don't even have to worry about your own life total, because every time the loop is completed, you'll be gaining life with Zulaport Cutthroat. So even if the life total disparity, disparity is large, you can still just win if they cannot interrupt it. Hapatra of Vizier of Poisons is a very interesting one of that can kind of go wide with just Hapatra and Yogmoth due to the ability to create a snake token and then sacrifice the snake token to make another snake token. Um, and put minus one, minus one counters on things along the way. So Hapatra has a low floor because it doesn't get any value upon ETB or upon death, but it has a very, very high ceiling and is therefore a really interesting synergistic one of alongside Yogmoth. We've got one ofs of uh, Phyrexian Revoker, Scavenging Ooze. We know what these cards do, right? They're really good hate bears, really good in certain situations. And at the top end, we have a one of Cavalier of Night. Looks a little weird. Card is nutty, in my limited experience. Four or five lifelink for five. That in and of itself is kind of incredible against aggressive decks, but it gets better. When it ETBs, you may sacrifice another creature. So just like Yawgmoth and just like Eldritch Evolution, the undying creatures have really good synergy with these sacrifice costs because we're not paying a full card most of the time for that. And when you do that, you get to destroy target creature in opponent control. So this is tutorable removal. It's a tutorable life-linking brick wall against aggressive decks. And as if that wasn't enough, when Cavalier of Night dies, you 
you can return target creature card, let's say Garolf's Messenger, uh, for, to the battlefield with CMC three or less for free. So it's a great way to establish yet another value positive loop. So yeah, deck is super cool. Deck is pretty strong um, from what I've seen and, and very, very unique. And we have a unique land base as well. The land base kind of sucks, not going to lie, because if you look at our spells, we've got to make double green very often on turn two, followed by a triple black on turn three, which is a tall order, even for modern mana bases, especially when you consider that our life total matters a lot. Life totals matter a lot right now in modern broadly, but again, to combo off a lot of the time, we'll need a higher life total than our opponent. So we can't play too many fetches and shocks. So our mana base does have four fetch, two shock, uh, only three basic lands, and four Blooming Marsh. But beyond that, it gets a little crazy. We've got three copies of Twilight Mire. Definitely a lot, because you cannot operate off one as your only land, and they also don't work well if you've got two of them as your only two lands. So playing multiples is disastrously bad, unless you absolutely have to. This deck absolutely has to. Sometimes you'll see four. We're only on three here. Uh, besides the Twilight Myers, we've got Pendle Haven. I don't know if I fully get this, but yeah, I can pump Young Wolf and do a couple other things. But uh, Call Me Garden, I get this. This ETB's tat, and it makes a plant. Not very exciting, but hey, plants are good Yawgmoth fodder, even good Eldritch Evolution fodder, even good ways to cast a Court of Calling. Um, so Calling Garden doing a lot in the deck. Nurturing Peatland, um, just because despite everything we just said, we are still a mid-rangey deck. We do still want some Flood Insurance. We can still Flood. Um, Urborg is another great fixer alongside Twilight Mire, making that card a whole lot better. And we've got a one of Dryad Arbor filling a similar role to Colony Garden, also able to get aggressive with 1-1 one, one beats, powered up by Pendlehaven no less, and can be fetched up by Verdant Catacombs. So definitely a land base with a whole lot of utility. The main reason I said it was kind of bad is because it loses really hard to Blood Moon, and it feels so bad to be a two-color mid-rangey deck losing hard to Blood Moon. That shouldn't ever really be the case, but it is for us here due to the extreme color demands of our spells. But that is what it is. Not a great deal to be done about that. In the sideboard, it's roughly a 50-50 split between interaction or other spell-based things to do and more one-ofs to tutor with our chords and our evos. So uh, addressing the former first, we have two copies of Thoughtseize, two copies of everyone's favorite Veil of Summer, two copies of Catch-All Removal. In this case, it's one Decay and one Assassin's Trophy. We also have a Damping Sphere, which I will note is a non-bow with our three Twilight Myers, but again, maybe these are necessary evils to include in the deck, and a one of Gaia's Blessing, which is Ancillary Graveyard Hate and really, really hard Mill Hate. As for the creatures, we can tutor up one of, of familiar favorites, Plague Engineer, Collector Oof, and Kitchen Finks. The use cases of those are all pretty obvious. We also have a Reclamation Sage, which is not a card that BGX decks usually play, but certainly a very, very understandable inclusion in a Chord and Eldritch Evolution deck. A couple spicy ones round out the 15 with Thrashing Brontodon, kind of serving as Rex Sage number two, but one that by the time the mid to late game is here and you're able to realistically tutor for a Rex Sage number two, it's got a bigger body so you can operate on a different axis if you just want to throw it down, have it as a safety valve, but also be able to attack and block well in the meantime. And Plague Crafter, which is a tutorable edict effect that does play really nicely in grindy matches with Cavalier of Night. Very, very strong synergies there. All right, guys, so that's the deck tech. That's the explanation of Yawgmoth combo for those who didn't know. I am still very new to the deck, so if I got anything wrong, please don't hesitate to correct in the comments. Don't want to spread incorrect information here, but I think I laid it out about as well as I understand it. And thanks once again to Connor Smith, the Spice Master of the Veil, for very generous support, uh, including other donation leagues to come, but for now, funding this one. We also have a couple other Patreon supporters to thank. We have Nostier who was responsible for the most recent Jund League, which was a great success, upping his level of support from Confidant to Tireless. Very generous, my friend. Thank you so much. Talking about generous, Ben Rees climbing the ranks yet again, going all the way 
from tireless to of the veil. You truly love to see it. Thank you so much, my friend. Super generous of you. And finally, LL Woods 89 I honestly, at this moment in time, don't remember whether I shouted you out on the last video or not. Um, but assuming I didn't, thank you so much for signing up as a confidant. I should really get more organized with this stuff, but hey, got a lot on my plate. So thank you, one and all patrons, especially Connor. Really appreciate you guys. And what you are about to see is a replay, and I think it's actually going to improve the quality much more than it would have been live recorded, which I did initially do. But I started watching it back and I was just like, this is just bad content. It went on for way too long because we were against a double, a couple double queuing opponents. I myself played pretty darn slow because I'm new to the combo. In many cases, they made me execute the combo in full. And also, again, I'm just kind of slow playing in general. I'm tanking over other decisions because I'm new to the deck. This is my first league with the deck. On top of that, we had a couple technical issues that I was like, how am I going to resolve these? And I said, you know what? The way to resolve them and the way to make the content better is to just rework it into a replay. So twice the work, but hopefully better content for you. And without any further ado, let's dive right in. Oh, wait, one more thing. Another cool thing about doing it as a replay is I'm going to show you some bonus footage at the end of the five league matches. We are going to look at some really cool, just quick scenarios that show other things the deck can do from my warm-up games, from my practice games that we did not encounter in the league. All right, with that said, on to round one. And here we are, my friends, with a really decent opening hand. It does not have any combo pieces. Um, or it does. Strangle Root Geist is a combo piece, right? does not have the combo piece, though, right? No Yawgmoth, but it's a keeper and a blind, if you ask me. I don't... I, in playing this deck, I didn't really feel that it should mulligan that aggressively toward the combo. Um... So in any case, we see the opponent going turn one giver of runes, ourselves having led on turn one birds of paradise, uh, have a slightly underwhelming turn in that we can only justify using two mana here. We just play the Geist and get some beats in, but we've drawn Yawgmoth, so we're set up for a T3 Yawgmoth. That is looking very, very good against a giver of runes deck. Opponent just plays a fetch land and does nothing else, so I figure, hey, let's kick it off with good old Yawgmoth, see what happens. And we're going to start things off just by going here after the Giver. We activate Yawgmoth, cashing in the Geist, putting a counter on Giver. And then it's time to cash in the Birds to reset the Geist. And then we get to cash in uh, the Geist, killing Giver. And after all is said and done, we are still poised to attack with a 3-2 Strangle Root Geist. So you can sneak an extra point of damage in, specifically with Geist, in situations like that, by ending your little loops when Geist is a 3-2 instead of the 2-1 at start of the turn as. Opponent will Ella Domri's call for a Devoted Druid. We also see that they're playing Luris of the Dream Den, so the presence of Call and Druid confirms that this is Devoted Devastation. Formerly known as Counter's Company, a creature-based combo deck. I don't know how good of a matchup it is for us. I think, in theory, they've got the ability to go under us with a combo. Um, certainly their combo is faster than ours on average, and certainly they don't care a lot about our undying value. However, if we are able to get an early Yawgmoth online like we did here, we are able to ruthlessly control their board. So that's my impression of the matchup. But again, I am very new. Um... The opponent plays the druid we knew about, and they also play the third land in a Birds of Paradise. Well, these, my friends, are some cards that we can beat. We've refueled handsomely off of Yawgmoth, and so we'll just start off by running out some dorks, uh, cashing in the Gilded Goose. Strangle Root Geist comes back. We're looping. We're killing their board. We take down their Birds of Paradise. We are basically turning our Gilded Geese into draw, Engines that allow us to complete one half of our little loop and also make some food tokens along the way in case that matters. Uh, after having played a couple of those, we get to dump out a wall of roots and a birds of paradise. Then we get to buy back the Geist yet again, killing their devoted druid, destroying their entire board, drawing... I don't know how many cards we drew. Did we draw five this turn? Something crazy like that. So we have to discard to hand size. And we've got a nice wide board. We're still ahead of the opponent, and after considering a play or two, the opponent will just scoop. So that was about as good as it gets, um, shy of outright killing them early, 
because we are just able to kill everything they're doing while pulling ahead on both life total and on total cards. So if that's not an advertisement for what the deck can do, I don't know what is. All right, my friends. So against Devoted Combo, we are bringing in one but not both copies of Thoughtseize. Um, all of our removal, which is Abrupt Decay, Assassin's Trophy, and Plague Crafter, and we are also bringing in Plague Engineer. To make way for these uh, inclusions that are mostly disruption-oriented, I do just kind of trim around the edges, scavenging ooze, um, Gilded Goose, Wall of Roots, Court of Calling all make way, as well as Zulaport Cutthroat. I anticipate being able to stay ahead of the opponent on the life total wars, therefore don't necessarily need that card. As always, my inexperience with this deck is vast. You're actually probably going to see more punts in this league than you're ever used to seeing when I play midrange, so do not take my sideboarding advice here as gospel by any means. I'm just giving you my thoughts on... Um, and I think in many cases there will be logical backing for those thoughts, but it is not informed by experience. In any case, uh, the opponent on the play, they take a mulligan, and then they lead off on Mishra's bobble. They will bobble themselves to inform their fetch decision, and then they will play another bobble, followed by a giver of runes. So opponent going affinity mode, getting nearly empty-handed on turn one between the mulligan and the uh, four cards deployed. We kept a one-lander, but we expect, outside of maybe a stray dismember or two, the opponent won't really have removal that they want to point, anyway, at a turn one monodork. So that's why I think we can afford to do that. Um, remember, we're not a mid-range deck. Traditionally, we don't have that many copies of cards like Abrupt Decay, so seeing one in the opening hand is really exciting. And otherwise, the hand was a nice early game hand. We can develop our mono, we can get pressure down on the board, and indeed, that's what we're going to do, especially having drawn Blooming Marsh. We get to go ahead and double spell. Uh, another reason why Wall of Roots is amazing is because it's a Monodork. The turn it comes down if you need it to be. So um, never feels good to pass up the chance to kill something out of this deck. But the opponent just played a land and passed. There's not really a must-kill creature yet. So we just get our pressure down, develop our mana, as I said, and kind of time walk the opponent. Opponent will then make a third land drop and go Duskwatch Recruiter. So this is pretty interesting. We wonder if the dreaded Veil of Summer is being represented. Unless they just drew Recruiter, which is possible. And you can't re read much into their keep because they did Mulligan Deep. So I don't think it's something we should play scared of. But at the same, at the same time, they have kind of gone out of their way to represent it. In any case, off of just two lands, we get to deploy a Yawgmoth because Mana Dorks are sweet. We will kick things off with a Strangle Root Geist Sacrifice, and then we'll target Giver of Runes, who I who is my first priority to kill. I don't want to. I don't think I'm worried about Duskwatch Recruiter out grinding me here, but I am worried about Giver um, protecting the combo. Right. So we start going after Giver with the minus one minus one counters first, and lo and behold, the opponent does indeed have Veil of Summer. So that's going to shut our stuff off. We could have responded to it because Yogmoth's ability, of course, at instant speed. But I like cashing in our whole board to kill Giver in response. I did not deem that to be worthwhile. So instead, we just, that resolves, you know, that's fine. We still got to draw a card off of it. And then the opponent will untap and path to exile us. So now in response, it's like, okay, we should probably do a little bit of something. I begin by cashing in the bird because the path is going to give us a land. Therefore, I don't feel as bad about cashing in the bird to reset the Geist, allowing us to then sacrifice the Geist to do at least something else. We're going to see a couple of fresh cards. That will better inform our decision. We'll shrink that Giver, who we still want to die, and then at the end of it all, we will trade the Geist for the Giver. And I think that's acceptable under the circumstances. After all of that, um, we're going to, because we haven't drawn another land yet, I want to leave Wall of Roots around. We'll let Path resolve. And then opponent's still just down to one card in hand. Um, despite having drawn off Veil of Summer, then they'll put Luris into hand, so they're up to two. Got it. So, uh, despite everything, um, you know, some things not necessarily going our way, it is still our eight cards in hand to the opponent's two. Feels pretty good. And we draw another Yawgmoth. Not that we really needed one. Uh, drawing the first one was great. Drawing the second one, maybe not so much. 
We could have jammed one, obviously, off of Wall of Roots, but really, what is that doing for us? Not all that much, as far as I can tell. So instead, we take a different path. We play out a Strangle Root Geist, get back ahead on the life total, start setting up for next turn. And speaking of setting up for next turn, we do deploy a couple one drops. Young Wolf, Birds of Paradise, very, very efficient turn. And we'll see what the opponent's got here. But with no combo pieces on the field yet, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, opponent going to try to compete with us on the value axis. Um, this is an unfamiliar feeling because normally I'm like sweating it whenever a Luris is going to resolve and buy something back. Here, not so worried about it because again, Yogmoth draws us so many cards, we can definitely outgrind that. Having said that, Luris is still kind of a premier target to remove. So we will go Yogmoth mode this time. We'll kick it off by looping y uh, Young Wolf, Strangle Root Geist. We're taking care of Luris. We will cash in Wall of Roots, so we're seeing a ton of new cards. And we gotta be a little bit careful with our life total, but it's not like they have reach, it's not like they really have haste, right? So we can go a little bit further, and we're just gonna take care of Duskwatch Recruiter too. We're gonna use our remaining mana to Abrupt Decay, Giver of Runes. Now, look at all the cards in our hand. What is it, nine? Yeah, it's nine. So with all these cards in hand, with all these options, obviously there's a couple different ways we could have sequenced there, but it's hard to go wrong, number one, as long as you're actually executing the loops in some respectable way here, which I think we did. And number two, in general, you can't really go too far wrong by just keeping the board entirely clear against this creature-based combo deck. So um, we'll pitch an Eldritch Evolution because we already have one in hand, and we'll pitch a land as well, discarding to hand size. Opponent will then Celestial Purge the Yawgmoth. We're just going to let it resolve. We have another one in hand, and after untapping, the opponent just concedes. The plan here, though, is going to be to attack see if that draws anything out. If not, they go to three, and there's many different ways we could kill them from there, but the opponent has just seen enough. So again, the ability of Yawgmoth specifically, especially when powered out on turn three, to control these small creature decks is something to speak of. Definitely very, very strong. And we never really needed to fully combo off on the opponent. As you saw, the pressure from the undying threats, the removal from Yawgmoth supplemented by our sideboard interaction, and all of the card advantage that Yawgmoth generates alongside undying threats was more than enough to bury devoted devastation on, uh, in, in, excuse me, round one. Alright guys, here we are for round two, and by the way, in respect to round one, I was over five minutes behind the clock on the opponent, so I hope you realize why it is definitely a little bit, uh, it's, it's just one of those leagues where working it into a replay does make a lot more sense to me than the alternative. Keeping that five lander with Wall of Roots doesn't really make much sense to me though, so in this blind game too, we will throw it back. And then we see an okay hand, you know, Court of Calling can help us find the missing piece, so we just put back the... Um, put the Overgrown Tomb back into the deck, planning to fetch it out most likely here on the end step, and we see the opponent play our most hated turn one land, which is Mystic Sanctuary. You do hate to see that, but we have at least a Strangle Root Geist to play. Um, there are some other draws that would have made me want to play Wall of Roots, but we draw Phyrexian Revoker, which is really interesting, could be good against a lot of Mystic Sanctuary decks, but rather than trying to guess what they're on and playing it out in the blind, I'm just going to get the Geist down, get the pressure down. Uh, seems better to me. Opponent goes Scalding Tarn and passes. So we have drawn Colony Garden. Once again, we're um, faced with the prospect of do we blind name with a Revoker or do we just kind of um, attack and keep developing our board in other ways? I do opt for the latter. So we play Colony Garden. We play Wall of Roots. We pass. On the end step, the opponent shows us Growth Spiral. They're going to play another land. They're going to ramp, and they're going to draw a card. So this is Wilderness Reclamation. They are in Simic colors for now, at least, only, and they have played Growth Spiral turn two into Wreck on turn three. Very bad news for us. Uh, this is a, a bugbear deck for me. It's just kind of miserable to play against, if you ask me, but we'll give it our best shot. We're going to run out the Young Wolf, and then we are going to pass. At this point, I don't really want to walk anything out into the untapped lands in the face of a wilderness wreck so i'm just going to try to pick my spot for a court of calling sadly for us we are one land short 
Um, if this Blooming Marsh could have entered untapped, uh, we could have corded for four. Instead, we can only cord for three. The opponent goes for a factor fiction, so... Um, oh no, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is one of a few different things that happened. I really thought I paid for the cord for four with Wall of Roots, but apparently I did not. Um, and that would have been the thing to do. I guess it, I just didn't click. And if you've ever used Wall of Roots, it is something weird where, if I'm remembering correctly, if you start paying for the spell before, um, like, w you cannot... How am I trying to say this? If you start paying for the spell first and then go to tap your lands later, Wall of Roots doesn't really register. So if you have one land and a Wall of Roots and you try to cast a two drop, well, you can't really do it. So then you have to undo and then you have to uh, activate Wall of Roots first to have the mana floating. That's how it's programmed on MTGO, if I'm not mistaken. I think what happened here is I started courting, I in the process of tapping for a cord, thought I activated Wall of Roots, and then when I resolved it, I said, why is it only three? That's what happened. So that was a punt, but it was a, like a way MTGO is programmed type of punt. Um, so feels pretty bad, but hey, um, I make worse punts later in this league. Don't worry about it. But we did have the ability, as I mentioned in the deck tech, to turn Wall of Roots into a two- mana mana dork there but I, I failed to access it so opponent doing wilderness wreck things and this is bad news for us right it's just bad news for us yogmoth would be better obviously but would it be enough i don't really think so in the opponent in the meantime factor fiction put a cryptic command into their hand cryptic command and polluted delta are in their hand they've archmages charmed and i just don't see a way out phyrexian revoker not really accomplishing much for us here and we just draw a swamp so we're doomed to a fate of the cryptic mystic sanctuary loop they can bounce the sanctuary they can get another sanctuary off the fetch lands and all the while wilderness wreck is doing its thing opponent's got five cards in the hand so i don't remember our exact board state but remember the messenger is what we ended up courting for so we didn't have the kill I don't think it's likely that we were going to get there either. But if you are courting, activate the Wall of Roots first. Learn from my mistake, but we do suffer an ignominious defeat against Wilderness Wreck in Game 1. Alright guys, so against Wilderness Wreck, I sideboarded bringing in Thought Seizes and Veil of Summers. I'm not so much competing over the card Wilderness Wreck itself as I am competing over their ability to stop my combo. So we're thought seizing to disrupt their permission. That can also take away Wilderness Wreck sometimes, but I think it's a losing battle to fight too hard over that. I think we'd rather punch through our ways to kill them. So two thought seize, two Veil of Summer, great ways to beat their permission. And we also do bring in a one of Reclamation Sage because it's easy enough to, you know, keep attacking tutor for that or, or cast that as a beater tag a wilderness wreck along the way but we're not committing too hard to beating that card so that's why i bring in the wreck sage which can do it right upon etb but not the thrashing brontodon and it's also why i did not bring an assassin's trophy again just not really competing over that here and to make way for the things we did bring in uh i don't think phyrexian revoker does enough here i don't think it's likely enough to uh that we can go off with hapatra uh so those cards get shaved as well as grindy stuff like Cavalier of Night and Wall of Roots and Eldritch Evolution. Wall's just a little slower than other mono dorks here and Eldritch Evolution. I never hate trimming that against combo because it is a, a two for one against you or maybe a one for one and a half for one against you if their permission lines up. So we're on the play here. We've got a pretty strong opening hand you do have to say. We've got acceleration into turn three Yogmoth, and i did have a i i really spooked myself into thinking that they would have um spell snare here which was probably just stupid frankly but i was like well i could go for the wall of roots into the cutthroat but if they spell snare the wall of roots then that'll be bad but i should have just gone for it i um some of my regular decision-making was thrown off by how much my brain was short-circuited by executing the combo of this deck. It, um, I, I 
am not the optimal Yawgmoth player. I think there's a steep learning curve for the deck, as I said here. But in any case, either way, we were set up for a turn three Yawgmoth. We do get it. We do decide to risk permission. And instead of permission, they have Ether Gust. So they're going to gust away the bird. Whatever. I mean, it's still a good play for them simply because it takes away Yawgmoth fodder. But despite that, we do bottom the bird because we have another dork in hand. We have a colony garden to deploy. So we're going to get some bodies down one way or the other. This time, we do, in fact, lead on Wall of Roots, giving us the ability to double spell if it resolves. But once again, uh, Aether Gust will put an end to that idea. So let's go plant, uh, cash in our plant with Yawgmoth. And then I'm content to, you know, turn that Colony Garden into a fresh card, basically, or the Colony Garden plant more accurately, and attack for a couple points of damage. See what the opponent has. Do they ever not have turn four Wilderness Wreck? Well, I guess sometimes, but doesn't seem like it, right? We draw Garal's Messenger, but we are still ahead of, of the opponent on cards. And we're going to lead on Scavenging Ooze. I like leading on Scooze here, and I like playing the land first. We play the land first to play around Monoleek. And also, uh, the third land will be called into action if the opponent does counter Scooze, because then we can play Messenger, and that'll be really good. I also like leading on Scooze, because Messenger is a serious win condition right now. But Scooze is also something where if it resolves, and we're still reading them for permission... It's kind of okay to just use the Scoos to attack their graveyard and to be another body in another disruptive force. So all in all, leading on Scoos making a lot of sense there to me. And sure enough, it will draw the opponent's cryptic command out, which will pave the way for good old Garalf's messenger. And then we get a lot of value here. We get to go attacking and we get to put the opponent pretty low and still have the ability to do some funky stuff with Yawgmoth. Opponent, as always, has Mystic Sanctuary buying back Cryptic Command. They will then Growth Spiral, putting another land down and looking for the Cryptic Bounce on Yawgmoth. I thought about this for a minute and then I decided to just let it resolve because the fetching the opponent did put them down to five and we have exactly five power on the field. So every point of damage accrued by Zulaport Cutthroat and by the back half of Garolf's Messenger, really relevant here. And this puts us in a great spot. Even though the opponent gets to untap with Wilderness Wreck, they've only got two cards in hand. And we can always just begin by moving to attacks, threatening lethal, seeing what they've got, and then taking it from there. We have also drawn Young Wolf uh, for turn, so that gives us the completed combo. Um, we've got a second Undying Creature to loop. And we've got Zulaport Cutthroat, not that we even needed it under this circumstance, but we've got to get this stuff to resolve. So as expected, we move to attacks, opponent will cryptic, tap down, and draw. Yawgmoth will come down, and then Young Wolf will come down, and then we get to execute our combo with Zulaport Cutthroat again involved for the first time, not that it's necessary. Opponent is going to Thought Scour us in response a couple steps into the combo, just looking for a little bit of more information on their on our deck, rather, before they scoop. So we did present um, just kind of like an aggressive start. We didn't disrupt them all that well, uh, although Scavenging Yu's prospect of disruption was enough to draw out a cryptic command, which gave us the opening to really start putting them within range of, le of taking lethal. Um, this is an example of a hand that can work against a deck like the opponents on the play. We have a relatively fast start, we get a relatively early Yawgmoth down, and we do have enough aggression to close out the game in a way where we ended up comboing uh, for the win, but didn't necessarily need to find the combo to get over the line. Game three yields a fairly nice opening hand for us. We've got turn one Thoughtseize or Monodork, as the case may be, into some good undying threats and a scavenging ooze, which the opponent definitely rated highly enough to cryptic last game. So we'll lead on the birds. Um, I definitely think that's correct here. We want the ability to double spell as early and as often as possible. And really, a lot of their big Thoughtseize takes will not be live next turn anyway. So uh, the opponent will end step Thought Scour themselves on turn one, putting a couple of good early game cards into the graveyard. So we get lucky there. He threw Gust and Ice Fan Quattle. And then they'll play a second island and they will pass back to us. Let's go to our main phase. We have drawn Strangle Root Geist. So the um, 
Wow, okay. I knew as soon as I started clicking a little faster, it would power through the discard turn. Well, let's review. So we do lead on Thought Seas, and we do see the opponent's hand. Remand, Cryptic Command, Thought Scour. Cryptic Command is the obvious take, but after a little bit of deliberation, I actually did take Remand, thinking, you know what? We, with our early board presence, if we can get under their remands, number one, we can stop them from hopefully finding a Wilderness Wreck early, uh, and if so, and if we're ahead on life totals, just attacking into the Cryptic Command, maybe finding a Court of Calling or something to hold up, will be a good enough way to fight through it. It's not like we're just that soft to a Cryptic Command in a vacuum on this deck. So I decide to try to kind of tempo them out by taking away their Remand. And of course, then we follow up on Geist, and we start getting aggressive with the Undying Mono Green Spirit. What a unique card, right? Pretty cool stuff. OP will Thought Scour themselves. Um, excuse me, this time they will Thought Scour us, milling Young Wolf and Eldritch Evolution. Then they'll play a Scalding Tarn, and they'll pass it back to us. We have drawn the third land, which is pretty much always welcome, right? But we're going to kick it off with a Geist, see what the opponent has managed to find. They found a Remand, a very, very good find for them. If we were committed to playing a second Geist this turn, even in the face of Remand, we would have tapped our lands differently. But my plan all along was to get the Scoos down to kind of diversify the headaches that were causing them or the potential headaches that were causing them. Opponent will then play Snow-Covered Island. They've now got Cryptic online. They'll pass back to us. We have drawn Cord of Calling. How interesting. So we're going to lead on Strangle Root Geist, this time tapping so we can play it back down through a remand, although we do not expect that. Indeed, it is Cryptic tapping the whole team down. So in response, we'll float him on him. We will eat the Cryptic. So we, we float a mana in response, then we let the Cryptic resolve, and then before we leave the phase, we will eat it out of the graveyard with Scoos, preventing further shenanigans. And then I thought about holding up a Scoos activation here too, but I said, nah, let's play Gilded Goose, specifically because we've got Court of Calling in hand. We want to be able to try to cord for Yawgmoth if the opponent goes shields down. So I believe we... Yeah, I actually think we still knew about one island in the opponent's hand, but whatever. They've got five cards in hand, no more cryptic that we know of. We draw a land, which looks pretty bad here, but in a way it's really not the worst. We want to hold up seven, uh, the ability to cord for four. So we need to hold up seven mana, including convoked creatures. Therefore, we just ship in with our two best attackers in the form of Geists. Also, notably, a better attacker into a potential Ice Fang than Scavenging Ooze will be who we do not want to lose. So we have a couple incentives here to hold Scoos back. And then the opponent back over to them. Hey, there's the Quattle. And then they're just going to untap. And Scoos is maybe ready to do some policing of their graveyard, but they don't seem to have anything. So now it's decision time. The opponent makes another land drop, and then just passes. They've got six lands open. They're a man deck. They're a Snapcaster Mage deck, maybe. They're definitely a Cryptic Command deck. They're definitely a Factor Fiction deck. So do we want to just YOLO a chord out into it? Well, if we had another, like, unbeatable bomb or another tutor effect on the main phase, I probably would. But here I decided we're going to play it a little closer to the chest. We're just going to wait on the chord. And once again, that's a benefit of having these aggressive attackers on the board. It's not like we need to beat their permission and find the combo now, or we'll probably never get there. Instead, it's like we can keep the prospect of the combo in our back pocket and keep trying to attack the opponent to death, especially because we've got this monosync of scavenging who's on the field, which is going to totally clean up their entire graveyard, making Mystic Sanctuary a lot worse, making other cards they could play, including possibly Uro, though we haven't seen him a whole lot worse. On top of that, we are rewarded even more because we draw Veil of Summer. So... Um, that is definitely really, really nice. And to that end, we now pivot toward a more combo-oriented plan, knowing that we can protect the cord should we go for it for Yawgmoth with a Veil of Summer, but we need one more creature to do so. So the opponent takes the hit, then on the end step, they're going to go for a Cryptic Command. In response, we will Veil of Summer right now. I think that's the optimal play because it's going to 
be a one monocryptic blowing out their four monocryptic. And then once it resolves, we can simply chord four, seven, and our stuff will not be countered this turn. So there's Yogmoth, and then we get to go off Strangle Root Geist is going to hit the bin, we're going to draw a card, we're going to kill their Quattel before anything else resolves, and then we'll pass to the opponent with the widest board we've ever seen, and a Yawgmoth on field, and a whole lot of things to like, but no Garolf's Messenger yet, right? So no way to just combo off on the opponent. Opponent will Growth Spiral, digging for action. And then when we go to combat, it is cryptic command time. So once again, we tap our mana dorks, then we let the spell resolve, and then we clean the cryptics out of the graveyard. It's just good practice, right? But we don't even really need to do that because we just second main a Garolf's Messenger, and now we've got the combo online, and the opponent will scoop to the first loop. So definitely a match that I really hate to play against and I'm really grateful to have won. I did make the mistake of not activating um, Wall of Roots in game two during my attempt to cord for Yawgmoth and also not noticing that I was only cording for three as I was clicking through it. Again, look at the disparity on the clock. I'm the one slow playing in these first couple matches. It's just a whole lot for my brain to grok. The way I'm presenting it to you, maybe it looks obvious. Maybe to other people it would be obvious. To me, I'm like, am I doing this right? Am I executing the combo right by clicking? You know, misclicking through the loops is very possible on MTGO. So uh, basically, long story short, I'm new it up a little bit, but I do think here in game three we found some pretty cool lines. I think I had a good sense of when to commit to attacks, when to um, commit to holding up the court of calling, how to deploy the threats. So I do think in some ways we earned the victory. When you beat Wilderness Wreck, it always feels like you're in the victory, right? When you're doing it with a black-green mid-range or mid-range style deck. But we do finish them with a flourish here with a combo kill. Pretty cool stuff, you have to say. This deck is definitely showing what it can do. A reasonable enough keep presents itself to us in a blind game one here of round three. And so far, so good with the league. Um, opponent will also... Mulligan down to six, and then they will lead on Bloodstain Mire, Mishra's Bobble. So we have drawn, I believe we just drew the third land. Maybe we drew that Eldr Eldritch Evolution, but either way, our hand is slow but relatively powerful. And against a overgrown two Mishra's Bobble deck, we know they're interacting, and therefore we're happy to just keep a functional hand. Opponent will show us Black Cleave Cliffs and a Scavenging Ooze, a couple pretty good indicators for Jund as opposed to other black-based Mishra's Bobble decks. And that's actually a huge problem for us, because against almost any other creature, we could have the prospect of using Garolf's Messenger as a nice, powerful two-for-one, but if they're able to kill everything that moves while gobbling up Messenger and other undying creatures we might find, we're actually going to find it tough to slug, slog through Jund. And uh, Skuz is far from a given in Jund these days, so I am feeling a little bit punished to see it on turn two. We don't have many outs to it game one. And then the opponent will, right on cue, play Liliana on curve, bash in with the Skuz. We are getting Junded out, and I played Hapatra there rather than Wall of Roots because I figured... In the face of T2 Skoos, I want to take the highest upside line. As soon as I saw Skoos hit the field, I was feeling a little bit bad about this one, but I figured if Sco if they don't have a way to answer it or if they have to sequence suboptimally to answer it, maybe that works to our advantage rather than one running like Wall of Roots out into certain death. But instead, we don't have... Uh, the ability to untap with Hippotra, and we also don't really have anything else to do. So I decide, once again, we're just going to say, highest upside line, let's check them for removal. We've already used up a Lily Edict. Hopefully they don't have anything else. Lily will take up. Opponent will pitch Tarmogoyf to their Lily plus one, which did surprise me. And we have the free pitch of Overgrown Tomb, but then they have K Command and all becomes clear this is a disaster. They K Command, buying back their own Goyf and killing our Messenger, eating Messenger with Skoos as Undying Trigger is on the stack, bashing in for three, and we are just getting soloed by the Skoos and getting Junded out. So then it's time for Wall of Roots and... You know, we could, like, Eldritch Evolution into a, um, 
Yawgmoth, but really Yawgmoth is just going to die to the Liliana anyway. So why don't we just play the Wall of Roots? Maybe it allows us to put together a good Court of Calling next turn. We've got to find some way to get out of this, but for now we're kind of getting jundied out. Uh, the opponent does not decide to take down to take care of Wall. Instead, they will take up. Once again, pitching the Goyf, we will pitch Blooming March. Scavenging Ooze coming across yet again, putting us on the ropes. And opponent will play Seal of Fire, and then they will say go. So between Seal of Fire and Mishra's Bobble, we know they're playing Lurus. They did not declare a companion, obviously, so Lurus is in the main deck to some degree or another. Uh, we crack Peatland. That was a borderline decision. Obviously, we can use available mana for better Chords of Calling. On the other hand, I said, let's put our faith in the deck to draw something useful. Instead, we draw two lands. So, Max punished for it. Feels pretty bad. And at this point, I'm not really sure what we can do. I think that was our window to come back. Feels like we're not really going to get there to me. But opponent will tick down with Lily. Content now to take care of the Wall of Roots, just to keep the board clear, maybe to feed the Skoos a little bit, and Liliana will stay around after the fact. So I'm thinking, okay, what do we do? You know, like, courting for Garolf's Messenger against Scavenging Ooze and Seal of Fire doesn't really make sense, although that'd normally be the value-positive three-drop to get against Jund. So I say, let's just cord for three, see what we've got. And after some um, contemplation here... I was like, you know, the only thing that could beat them, strangely enough, is Phyrexian Revoker. Revoker dies to a stiff breeze and therefore is pretty bad against Jund, who can kill it from a variety of angles with a wide variety of cards, and broadly its 2-1 body is completely outclassed. However, under these circumstances, hey, we don't really have anything else to do that I saw. Opponents only got two cards in hand. Maybe, just maybe, they won't have removal this time. So we name Seal of Fire which is going to shut off the opponent's removal that we know about. And hopefully, just hopefully, it will stop them. Slow them down? No, no such luck. Opponent then just plays a Ren and Six, ticks down, makes the Revoker look highly embarrassing. We untap, we draw Monodork. That's just going to do it. So definitely a brutal one. Uh, there were a couple windows where if we could Eldritch Evolution into a Cavalier of Night, that might have been interesting. But once again, uh, well, number one, we didn't have a three drop to toss away to evolution. Number two, Scooze beats that too. So again, I can't stress enough how the Scooze on T2 just flipped the script totally. We could weather the Liliana, the Seal of Fire, the Renin 6, even the Tarmogoyf maybe, but Scooze eating the back half of our Undying Threats, uh, making our hand a lot worse and also the prospect of Eldritch Evolution a lot worse. We just got jundied out pretty bad and it was all due to this one weird trick. Okay, sideboarding against Jund, I took this approach. We're bringing in at all of our interaction, basically. Two Thought Seas, two Veil of Summer, um, Assassin's Trophy, Abrupt Decay, and Plague Crafter. Making way for those powerful sideboard cards will be uh, Phyrexian Revoker, which has a lot of targets, but again, is just never going to live to be a lock piece. Uh, Hapatra, who is really bad against interaction, and broadly I've been envisioning as a Game 1 card anyway. And Court of Calling... Uh, which can be tough, so we trim a cord because it can be tough to keep a wide board wide enough to make cording effective against Jund. And Zulaport Cutthroat, again, we're never going to have like a four card combo going, and again, it dies to everything. Um, and then we trim some Monodorks, three Birds of Paradise, and one Wall of Roots is what I chose to trim away. It's actually eight cards, pardon me, and we are also bringing in Kitchen Finks, which is a nice grindy card in and of itself. And we've got a very respectable opening hand. A big part of me wants to just pass holding up Veil of Summer the entire time, but I don't think that's realistic, especially because our second land in hand is Urborg, which cannot cast any of our early plays anyway. So it's not like we could just start playing things out on turn two while holding up Veil. We would just be holding up Veil and doing nothing indefinitely. Therefore, I decide let's just play out the Gilded Goose, make the opponent have removal for it, or cast a discard spell to punish us for going shields down. They do have removal, which is not great, but we do get to leave a food token behind, which is not nothing. We also draw Blooming Marsh, allowing us to play the Young Wolf and hold up Veil. Sure enough, opponent Inquisitions right into our Veil. They also, I don't believe I mentioned, but I believe they did mulligan to six. So it is now our virtual eight-card opening hand against their six because 
the mulligan plus the Veil of Summer on their discard spell. Uh, I hate to be that guy, but we are officially that guy. We also get to combo off this turn. Not with the Yawgmoth combo, but with Pendlehaven targeting Young Wolf for another point of damage. Alongside the Strangle Root Geist getting in, how can Jund ever recover? I don't think they can. They play a Scavenging Ooze, which is obviously really scary. Makes me almost want to eat my words right away, but they don't have a third land, so it's a lot less scary than it would otherwise be. We play Urborg. We fetched Basic Forest to respect our life total, knowing that Urborg was coming to be a good mana fixer. And then we are going to evolve the Strangle Root Geist into a Yawgmoth, and we're going to waste a little time in starting to uh, generate some value with these loops. We're going to draw a bunch of cards. We're going to loop these guys to our heart's content. You know, can't go too, too low on life total, but we do have a lot of scope to play with our life total. Turn it into card advantage. And eventually, after a few loops, I am going to start targeting the Scavenging Ooze. We have to cash in the Young Wolf to finish off the Skoos, but at the end of it, we've drawn whatever we drew. I think seven cards this turn, something close to that, maybe five or six, whatever. We drew an ungodly amount of cards. We picked a couple to hand size, and we have killed a Scavenging Ooze while also upgrading our Geist into a 3-2 attacker, keeping our life totals near to the opponents and having a much more powerful board and a much more full grip. So absolutely dumpstering the opponent. But again, they stumbled in a few different ways. They mulled a six, they got their Inquisition veiled, and they never hit a third land. Meanwhile, we're powering out that early Yawgmoth. So this is how it can go against Jund. But game one is also how it can go against Jund. So uh, definitely an interesting matchup, and we do go into game three on the back of a really strong game two win. All right, so R7 is a lot less exciting than it was in game two. Um, we don't have early Monodorks, but we obviously don't want to mulligan aggressively toward them. They are a low card quality category of, of creature, and we sided them out, I think, with some relatively good cause. So um, even though our hand is clunky and slow, it's got some mechs for ones. It's got Geist and Messenger. It's got Trophy. I'd rather see Decay early, of course, but it does have Interaction, too. And if we get to the top end, it's Cavalier of Nighttime, who should be amazing in the matchup. So we've got to fade uh, really scary progressions from the opponent, and we've also got to draw some lands. We've done the latter. We rip Overgrown Tomb for a turn. I'm quite happy with that. Opponent's turn one of Raging Ravine and Bauble leads to a turn two Renin six, but with no land to buy back. So very, very interesting. And a big part of me um, was not sure what to do here. One thing to do is to just play the Strangle Root Geist. It's never a bad turn two play against almost any deck, and it can start pressuring the Ren, which is exactly what I do. On the other hand, it gives the Ren something to do by taking down and taking care of one half of the Geist, and maybe uh, another part of me wants to say, let's just play the Wall of Roots and continue to make the Ren bad. So I wasn't exactly sure what to do there. Being uncertain, I did opt for the um, more proactive line. Opponent, unfortunately, does not miss a beat this time. Turn 3, Lurus buying back a bobble. They're going to bobble us on our upkeep to find out about our Young Wolf. Young Wolf coming back. And the Ren also ticked up, uh, just to continue absorbing attacks from the Geist, I suppose. So we lead off on Wall of Roots, and then we decide we're going to attack Ren, offer the trade with Lurus, and obviously don't expect them to take it, and they don't. So they go down uh, to 1, and then... In our second main phase, unfortunately, we are, in my view, priced into trophying the Lurus. Just cannot allow Lurus to bury us with those bobble loops. Uh, in game one, Lurus was buying stuff back, rather in round one, uh, against the Devoted Devastation deck. But it's very, very different against Jund. It's also very different when we have a Yawgmoth on the field outgrinding their one card per turn. Um, we cannot currently outgrind a one free card per turn loop, not at all. So to that end, we trophy, we ramp the opponent, and at least our consolation was that the Ren and Six wasn't really doing much besides absorbing attacks, but they top deck Baron Moore. So that's a, a real problem for us. We have beaten one loop by trophying the Lurus only for them to establish another. So they cycle more, they will buy it back, 
and then they will make a land drop, and then they will play Ashiok Dream Render. And my thought process here was I saw the Ashiok, and I was like, oh, thank goodness it's not a Skuz. Thank goodness it's also not even a Tarmogoyf, right? Because we can just attack these things off the field. It's not going to be that big of a deal. And I kind of had that thought process register mentally. And then I drew Gilded Goose. And then I started really getting into the weeds about what my best play is, what my best attack is. And I ended up going down a rabbit hole that involved Eldritch Evolution with the Wall of Roots. Only big problem is Ashiok is on the field. So guys, it happened. It finally happened to me. It finally happened to me. Ashiok was released on... April 27th, uh, if this Google result is correct, of 2019. So it's been out for like almost exactly a year and a half at the time of this recording. This was the first time I recall ever trying to search into an Ashiok, an active Ashiok. So F in the chat for our wall of roots and for our Eldritch evolution and for me for punting into the Ashiok. I told you guys that this would be a bit of an ugly league in places. The big brain required to play Yawgmoth is using all of my IQ points and then I'm forgetting to do things that I would normally remember to do. So we do get to attack the run off the field finally, but the opponent has blown us out a bit with Ashiok, has blown us out with another Lurus off the top after we spent a precious piece of interaction to deal with the first one. Buying back a bobble, it's all pretty bad. We need something crazy off the top like the usual suspects, right? But instead we draw another dead Eldritch Evolution. So then what have we got here? I look at the attack. It doesn't look good because there's now a 5-6 Tarmogoyf, so I decide to pass, and we play Garolf's Messenger. So even though my punt into Ashiok was terrible, had I not made that punt, I don't think anything changes. We would have played the Messenger last turn, and then this turn we'd be looking at very little. So we would be up a card, but the card would be dead in hand. It would be a second evolution, and we could also play Gilded Goose this turn. So definitely missing out on some stuff, but whether it's too crazy, I'm really not sure about that. Cavalier of Night is still uncastable, um, at least it would be for this turn, but... Um, we'd also have a wall of roots on the field if I didn't say that. So don't get me wrong, definitely a costly punt, but I don't know if it changes a whole lot. Opponent will untap, they will inquisition away wisely our wall of roots because our EE again dead in hand. Opponent with another run and six. We're getting so punished by their threats because we're spending again our limited resources dealing with them only for them to draw duplicates of legendary things. And both of these things are establishing loops, so they've got the Baron Moor loop, they've got the Bobble loop off of Luris. It's just all a little bit much for us. We are getting jundit out, and there's no reason for the opponent to really do anything with their attackers. They're drawing three cards per turn. They have two Planeswalkers on the field. It's all pretty bad. So uh, once again, I look at attacks, decide not to do them. We'll Thought Seize them. They have two lands and a Plague Engineer in hand. We'll take the Plague Man, and then we're just kind of here waiting to die. Opponent will play a Nile Spell Bomb, and that is just enough for me. They've got a way to beat the back half of our threats as well. They can start pinging with Ren and Six, and they can take out Messenger with Seal of Fire. They can sweep them all up with Spell Bomb, and then they can loop the Spell Bomb if they think that's better than looping the Bobble, which it probably is without other spells in hand. And they're still looping the Baron more, so we get jaunted out badly. And I misplayed into the Ashiok, but. As the game unfolded, it becomes very clear that it did not matter whatsoever. So learn from my mistake, and I can console myself that maybe somebody out there will not play into an Ashiok with a search effect, because they remembered me doing so, and also console myself with the fact that we didn't really have a way through the Junding out here in round three. So Jund putting the brakes on the Yawgmoth train. It was a really cool match, though, really well played to the opponent. Obviously, I'm never sad to lose to Jund if I've got to drop a match. It might as well be to one of my favorite decks. Well, we've been doing okay with the die rolls up until this round four where we lose it, and we've got the non-bow in hand. We've got two turn one plays, and we can't cast either because our lands are Twilight Mire and Urborg, and the T1 plays are green. So, feels bad.
Opponent goes, turn one Leyline of Sanctity. That also feels bad because it's going to shut off Garolf's Messenger and therefore shut off a major win condition for us, whether by helping, you know, just to get us over the line with those two, uh, two points of life loss here and there, or of course by comboing off. Opponent will then go Prismatic Vista for Island into Serum Visions. So what deck plays Serum Visions and Leyline of Sanctity? And fetch lands definitely seems like a combo deck to me. Uh, main deck leyline, no less. Opponent will play a tapped steam vents and then pass, so no bolt on the bird or anything like that. And then we just run out strangle root geist and young wolf, and we get to beating. We're going wide as wide as we can, as fast as we can, and we've got yogmoth in hand. We've also drawn messenger, who's still a beater, even though he's a lot worse without the ability to drain the op. Opponent then goes. Spire Bluff Canal, Sleight of Hand, passing back to us. So a blue-red deck, no splash color, it seems. The presence of Spire Bluff Canal and Prismatic Vista are pretty good indicators for that. We're then just going to main phase a Yawgmoth, see what happens, um, whether he does or does not resolve, and then it is comboing off time, or at least the beginnings of such. We're going we're gonna to interrupt our little loop by attacking. This is the maximal time to attack because the Geist is a 3-2 and the Young Wolf is not summoning sick um, where he would be if we cashed him in for the loop. So we draw another Geist, that's fine. Um, we've got a fourth land in hand as well, so we'll just pass knowing we can draw more cards at instant speed if need be. Opponent then gives up the game. It is an as-for-told deck. This deck is very tilting to face, if you ask me. It is a Restore Balance Electro Dominance deck, and here's the Restore Balance. So we're basically sacking some our entire board of creatures. We're going to lose a card out of hand, and we will not, thankfully, this time have to sacrifice Sacrifice lands because they don't have a greater Gargadon to gobble up all their own lands with first. So, Restore Balance obviously going to resolve. We are going to draw some cards in response with Yawgmoth. We'll cash in the Birds of Paradise, and then we will actually reset the Strangle Root Geist, and then we'll let it happen. And what's going to happen here, the Undying stuff is going to come back. That feels pretty freaking good, if you ask me. Definitely a great way to get some unforeseen value against the Restore Balance deck. They're not really accounting for going wide with Undying Threats when they're planning to Wrath the board with Restore Balance. That, I can pretty much assure you. On top of that, we draw a backup Yawgmoth. Feels good, man. And then we're going to... Is this... Um, is that where I punted? I think somewhere in this game I misclicked. But in any case, we, we do just cash in a Strangle Root Geist to draw a card. Probably should have been the Young Wolf. Not entirely sure. And I think what happened is... Yes. Okay. So the opponent just scoops anyway. Didn't matter. Uh, we basic, we have them virtually dead on board. It should have been literally dead on board. There was no reason necessarily for me to do it right there. But what happened is I did misclick. Um, so if you're in that situation where both of your creatures have a counter on them, you can obviously put a minus one minus one counter on one of them and reset it and then sacrifice the other one i misclicked somehow i think i selected the same creature twice i believe that's what was going on again my brain is being pulled in many different directions playing with this deck so a bit of a misclick there um unless the replay is acting up but no i do think i remember misclicking at some point near the end of this game as you can see it didn't matter the undying beats getting us over the line the yogmoth value helping along the way in a in a major major way and really undying just making restore balance look like a joke now that won't always be the case um sometimes the opponent as mentioned will have a greater gargadon they'll leave us without any lands and then it's kind of a big question mark as to whether the back half of our threats can get us over the line definitely won't always happen but in this case we get some free value off of the undying stuff that proved to be crucial to stealing game one from as foretold restore balance electro dominance combo Okay, so I wasn't exactly sure how to side here for game two, partially because, as always, I'm not that familiar with the deck that I'm playing, but also because the as foretold Electro Dominance decks that I've seen, they do vary enough, where I was not exactly sure 
how much removal to expect, how much permission to expect, but having seen really neither in game one, I figured, well, maybe we can expect, like, is it charm? If, if nothing else, just like a card that can flex into both roles. Maybe permission is more likely than removal if I didn't see either there, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, so to that end, I do think Thought Seize is a must, even though they could have Leyline. I did bring in my Veils of Summer as a hedge against potential permission cards, like is it Charm Remand, the types of permission that a deck like this would play, and also brought in the Reclamation Sage, but not the Brontodon, following the exact same principle that I enumerated against Wilderness Wreck, that is, committing mostly to racing and disrupting. Uh, Wreck Sage is a one-of that you can have as part of your curve out that can tag an ass for told, or a wreck in the previous matchup, is more or less a free roll, but I'm not committing too hard to fighting it by bringing in cards like Assassin's Trophy and Thrashing Brontodon. We also have Abrupt Decay in the mix as well, following the same principle again, that tags as for told, doesn't do that much else. That's kind of how I was seeing it going into game two. I believe I changed my tune a little bit, um after seeing a little bit more of what they have done. But in the meantime, this is what we did. We trim around the edges, lose a Scooze. Uh, we lose a Messenger, uh, respecting a hedge against the Ley Line a little bit. Don't want too many cards that are shut off or made worse by a Ley Line. Uh, we cut the Grindy Cavalier of Night, and then we trim Wall of Roots and Court of Calling, just some of our slower uh, tutor pieces or Mana Dorks. So... Uh, I think that sideboarding is at least, like, internally, logically consistent. Although, whether it is optimal, I leave to you to decide. Opponent keeping another uh, Leyline 7 feels bad. Opening once again on turn 1 Serum Visions. We did beat this start last time, and we do have a pretty good opening hand here. So, um, we have Young Wolf T1. Opponent has another Visions. And they get stuck on one land. They get stuck on one land. That feels awesome. They have bottomed with all the visions, obviously. They're just trying to dig for a land. But I believe the second Serum Visions, they put one on top. So they probably put a second land on top. But in the meantime, they did miss a crucial land drop on a crucial turn. And then we got the Geist coming down for the beats. Opponent, again, we saw them scry to the top. So they put that island on top, and then they play Relic of Progenitus. So definitely a pretty good one, but we are just shoving all in. Our hand does not really send us any other signal as far as I can tell. And if we are worried about removal, which, as I mentioned, might be in there, uh, spot removal like Lightning Bolt, is it Charm, a Braid? I've seen this deck play cards like that. We want to try to overload their one-for-ones. Even though the one-for-ones are backed up by Relic, we can still get there by going wide. So that's definitely something I'm interested in doing. They also haven't showed me a single red yet, so I'm not playing around Anger of the Gods. So... We just go wide, we've got the beats coming down, and the opponent will tap both their lands, exile Simeon Spirit Guide, and then power out an as foretold, not not even ahead of curve, just ahead of their land drops, right? But it's back over to us. We're gonna jam a Yogmoth. We are going to upgrade a Geist as an attacker right now, or so I thought this was a punt playing into Relic. I think like drawing with a Yogmoth is probably good here, but we should have attacked first. I completely forgot about the Relic um, in my haste to figure everything else about what the opposing deck exactly is up to. Piloting my own unfamiliar deck definitely walked into the Relic unnecessarily missing two points of damage and again if i was to sacrifice something to the relic activation it should have been a young wolf not a geist the opponent follows up though with another relic followed by a free restore balance so things are going from bad to worse for us um we do get our stuff eaten by the relics and we are just going to try to draw as many cards as we possibly can and we put a few cards in the graveyard before the rest of our stuff hits the bin. And then we kind of have, you know, the ability to keep more Monodorks in hand or to keep the Eldritch Evolution in hand. I do think we want to keep the third land in hand either way. So we do um, take maybe a more optimistic line and I think probably a correct line of keeping the EE in hand. But opponent just operating very smoothly over there. Their Relic able to completely blow us out. We draw Thought Seize, which would be a great time for it if they didn't have a Ley Line of Sanctity. So we just have to play a bird. Say go. 
and then the opponent draws a third land. They play another As Foretold. So, you know, it's possible they have too many As Foretolds, Ley Lines, stuff like that in hand. We need to fade another payoff, pretty obviously, right? So we're going to float some uh, green with the birds, and then we're going to go for an Eldritch Evolution, and it does resolve. So unfortunately, we cannot get Yawgmoth, and also the three drop of Messenger is made a lot worse by Leyline of Sanctity. So I decide to just go get Strangle Root Geist. We're just going to put the pedal to the metal. The opponent's all the way down to six. We're going to attack them down to four if we connect, and we sure do. So it's back to the OP. They take As Foretold up to three, and they had an Anger of the God stranded in hand, but now they get to cast it for free. Wiping our board, dealing with our Geist, feels bad. Feels bad. We draw a land. So the opponent will relic us. We'll pass the turn. It's back to them. We're just concealing information with this overgrown tomb. They make a land drop. And now we're flooded. We've weathered two board wipes and a relic of Progenitus, the second one sitting on the field. And now we flood. And our thought seizes and messengers are locked out by their ley line. It's a pretty bad spot to be in. We draw the third straight land. Definitely not looking good. But you know what? The opponent's flooding too. And again, they could still have some pretty bad stuff in hand. Their as foretolds are at 6 and at 4, respectively, and we draw a Veil of Summer. So it's still not proactive action, but it could potentially help us get there. But to be fair, so far they haven't really showed us anything that cares about Veil of Summer, so I'm a little bit ambivalent about that. We draw Eldritch Evolution. Okay, so that's some form of action. It's enough to prompt me to deploy the fetch land, because on their end step we can tutor for a Dryad Arbor and then potentially evolve it into something or try to double spell next turn. We'll just have to see what they show us. But opponent basically just saying go, so we'll go fetch the Arbor, and then we will... The opponent will tank a little bit, I think, on the end step, but then we'll untap. We draw Birds of Paradise, so that makes me want to just say, okay, we can technically double spell, triple spell if Veil is relevant next turn. Let's just begin by attacking with Arbor. See what they do. They don't do anything. So I said, all right, I'm just going to make them beat the Arbor. I don't want to walk into another Anger of the Gods. And that could be one thing they definitely have. So on the end step, they will Electro Dominance just to ping the Dryad Arbor. I don't believe they cast anything else off of that. So good enough for me, I guess. Dryad Arbor trading one for one and doing a crucial point of damage. OP will free cast a second Ley Line of Sanctity, then it is back to us. We continue to Flood, so I'm going to lead on the Bird, and then I'm going to go for Eldritch Evolution here, targeting the Bird. Once again, a lot of our usual good options are made a lot worse by those Ley Lines, so I just go get Geist. I just go get Geist, and we're going to try to connect, and the opponent takes the hit. They're down to one. Will we, against all odds, cheese out this win on turn 14? Well... The opponent starts by drawing Ancestral Vision for turn and casting it, which is Ancestral Recall under these circumstances. They find another Anger of the Gods to deal cleanly with our Geist. Then they will Serum Visions, and then it is Greater Gargadon time. And now they get to do all of their Restore Balance Electro Dominance BS that they want, but they played a little cautiously for now. Uh, we'll play out another Fetch Land, but obviously we drew another land. We're flooding disastrously, but we're at least bluffing another Dryad Arbor this way. It could make them sequence a little differently, but they look to be shoving all in on the Gargadon, and we have just drawn way too much air, but we still did get um, about as close as you can get. I don't know if I played that optimally simply by holding Twilight Mire in hand. Maybe I should have played the Mire and held a different land in hand that we could operate off of by itself just to play around the prospect of them having Restore Balance, which indeed they did. After all that, they get to bring the Greater Gargadon back. They get to attack us. It's a two-turn clock. And to be fair, what are we going to do against this? They have Crashing Footfalls to follow it up. So technically, it is good practice to maybe have played the Mire and helped the Fetch Land or something. In practice, we just draw a Court of Calling, and we're very, very dead anyway. So I don't know if I could have done much different that game besides not blunder into the Relics early on. 
Um, and with the opponent down at one, maybe that cost us the game. Obviously, the entire sequence that they take would be different from there, but in a vacuum, you could say, yeah, that was a costly mistake. So, again, I never claimed to play this deck optimally. We had a few punts this league. This was one of them, and either way, whether or not it cost us this game, it's hard to say, but they did get over the line. But... They had to board wipe us like four times to get there, and we flooded like crazy, and we misplayed, and they were still at one. So it was really, really close, but I think this is still kind of a bad matchup, so it feels like that was the one that got away, but there is still a game three. So for Game 3, having experienced that uh, progression from the opponent, I take the Veils of Summer back out. They haven't showed us any permission yet that I can recall. And we're bringing Assassin's Trophy back in. We're staying a little bit more uh, close to the main deck configuration as well. So we're able to have a higher density of threats, combo off more efficiently, and also compete over the, um, you know, as foretold, even the Greater Gargadon with a card-like trophy. And our keep is okay. It's okay. It's not that thrilling. Uh, it doesn't have Geist, which might be the very best card in this matchup, or at least one of them. And it doesn't really have, you know, Thought Seas, and for once they didn't keep a uh, Leyline 7, but they did keep a 7. In any case, we do have a functional hand here. We're going to just shock in uh, to deploy that young wolf, because I don't think our life total matters much. We are also holding up Abrupt Decay here in case they Simeon Guide out a turn two, as foretold, but they do not. They will play Sleight of Hand into Fetchland, and then it's back to us. We draw another Monodork, so we've got a lot to do, but our progression is, like, forcing us to walk out into an Anger of the Gods, most likely. We can also take kind of an aggressive line, an aggressive early Eldritch Evolution here, and that's what I do. And we go to get Garolf's Messenger. It's good value. Once again, though, whether we're just like taking it slower with a bird or whether we're cashing a goose in to turn it into a uh, Messenger, either way, we're soft to an anger. So we've really got to fade that. Opponent doesn't have it this turn. They're going to suspend a Greater Gargadon, playing a third land, and they're going to say go. Back to us. Here come the Undying Threats. Crossing the battlefield yet again to connect for four, and then they didn't have anger last turn. We're gonna make them have it this turn. So we play the goose, we play the birds. I really don't think they would wait for a bigger blowout than that. Like two for oneing two undying creatures, which is a two for one in a, in practice and kind of a four for one conceptually. I don't think they'd pass that up, right? So. On the end step, opponent will Electro Dominance off of Simeon Spirit Guide to tag our Birds of Paradise and to draw three with a free cast Ancestral Vision. Little scary. They will then have Greater Gargadon tick down. They'll play an island. They will Serum Visions off of the island. And then it is, they're tapping three, it's really scary, but thankfully it's not Anger of the Gods. However, it is as foretold, and they do have a payoff, it's crashing footfalls, the Rhinos hit the battlefield, it is definitely still a bit scary, but we are ahead on life totals, and who do we draw? That's right, we draw the big guy, we draw the namesake card, we draw Yogmoth, the infamous Thran physician, so that feels pretty good, and that's all well and good. We cannot hard cast him, though, so I'm just like, what's going on? I saw the Yawgmoth, got so excited, can't hard cast him, because they tagged our Birds of Paradise, but you know what we can do? We see him and we get the idea. Let's go get him with Eldritch Evolution. That's pretty good, too, and you know what? That's good enough. It's a little bit clunkier, it's a little bit harder, but we've got two Undying Threats on the field. They're tapped out. One of the Undying Threats is Garolf's Messenger, and that's actually just game. The opponent knows that. They're going to scoop to the first loop of the combo. So, um, I had a moment. <laughs> I was kind of like recreating my in-game experience there, because remember, I'm not seeing things right away, because I'm a noob with this deck, so I'm like, yes, we draw Yogmoth. that's the combo, and then, oh no, wait, we can't hard cast him, and then oh wait, yes, we can tutor him, and then the whole time I'm second-guessing myself, do we really have the combo, but all's well that ends well, we do get there against a deck that I hate in three tough matchups, 
Um, it feels weird to say we got under them with the combo this time, but we kind of did, right? We kind of did. Um, I guess it wasn't so much the disruption that we presented as a matter of them just like not quite having the early combo all ready to go, but they're not really an I-win combo. They're like, here are some things that's really hard for you to beat combo. Um, and we found our I-win combo before uh, we could get buried by whatever else they had coming down the pipeline. So a great little victory here in Game 3, taking us to 3-1 and one on the debut league for Yawgmoth Combo. Fifth and final round here, back to our winning ways with the die roll, and the hand is strong but slow. I do decide to keep it in the blind, um, taking a mid-range style approach where we have a ton of resources at our disposal. Let's find a way to turn them into a victory. Turn one, Colony Garden, make a plant. Can you beat that OP? I doubt it. I doubt it. Pretty strong play. We draw Strangle Root Geist, which um, against the opponent going Mountain Pass, I am much more excited to do that than I am to play a Hapatra, who seems like it'll likely die to a Lightning Bolt. So Geist is going to come across, start the attacks. Opponent does nothing, so we've kind of time-walked a mono, what appears to be a mono red deck. That doesn't happen very often on turn one. But the opponent says, we don't care, we've got Kiln Fiend. So we didn't need a turn one, we just need a turn two and a turn three. We draw Nurturing Peatland. We're pretty grateful for that. Um, that's going to make our hand actually functional. Um, so even though it's painful, we'll take any untapped land that we can get, especially one that produces black. So with Twilight Mire able to fix Colony Garden, we are able to cast a Messenger, but um, we just are trying to survive for a few turns, and to that end, we leave the Geist and the plant both back. Um, our plans to block are foiled right away, because the opponent will open up on a crash through, and then... They tank for a while, and then they cast Forked Bolt, and I have such mixed feelings about that because my first foray into Mono Red Prowess, which is what we're against, involved me looking at the lists, seeing what was out there, looking at all the shock effects. First, I was trying to figure out why some people play Burst Lightning, other play, others play Firebolt. Occasionally, you saw people play Wild Slash back then. And I looked at all the shocks, and I was like, why does nobody play Forked Bolt? And so when I was brand new to the deck, the thing that I brought to the table if I brought anything to the table, to the Mono Red Prowess community, was like kind of repopularizing Forked Bolt a little bit, maybe. So I have such mixed feelings about getting hit with a blowout Forked Bolt like this. Look how good it is. X1, X1, dividing it with one mana, plus three, plus zero to the Kiln Fiend. It had crash through anyway, so not maybe strictly necessary, but still a crazy blowout. But hey, Undying. Undying is better than Forked Bolt, right? Well, not if the opponent has two of them. So another Forked Bolt taking care of the back half. Kiln Fiend smashing us for 10 uh, feels pretty bad. So it's back to us, and we draw another Court of Calling. Uh, pretty bad draw, right? So all we can do is play the Messenger. Hope the opponent is kind of out of gas, um, but Mono Red Prowess doesn't really run out of gas in this sense, all that easily. They do, however, play another Kiln Fiend, and then they Lava Spike us. So definitely have seen worse uh, and feared worse draws from the opponent. So we do have a bit of a reprieve. Unfortunately, our hand is kind of doing a whole lot of nothing right now. We draw a Wall of Roots. So I say, okay, you know what? We need to take some high upside lines, take a little bit of a risk to win this game. Opponent didn't have burn spells last turn, or maybe at most they had one, right? So we will swing in with a messenger. We can't just sit back forever. They'll just draw two burn spells and we'll be dead. So we attack with one, and then we go Wall of Roots into Hapatra, which is going to make two blockers. Uh, Hapatra can trade with a fiend. Wall can probably not chump a fiend, but... Um, effectively. It, it will be chumping is what I mean to say. But, you know, I think this is probably our highest upside line, and we were still above three, and we are starting to race the opponent back to the best of our ability. Sadly, opponent just draws a lava dart, so we are done. Uh, we scoop to that because even without doing anything else, without pointing anything at the blocks, uh, the blockers, without making any attacks, we're just dead to the lava dart. So opponent um, exploding out of the gates with Kiln Fiend, us with a hand that 
if they didn't have such a huge Kiln Fiend attack, might have actually lined up well enough against them for us to get something going. Especially after this turn, because we're developing our mono, we're going wide, we're able to maybe Court of Calling uh, for, um, what's it called, the 5 drop. The lifelink uh, Cavalier of Night. That's that's the one. That could have been a real thorn in OP side. Maybe just maybe we could have gotten there. But as is the combination of Kiln Fiend and Forked Bolt, a little too hot for our deck to handle. Sideboarding's pretty easy here in my view, my friends. We need Kitchen Finks. We need um, removal. So Assassin's Trophy, Abrupt Decay, Plague Crafter against Mono Red Prowess. All those cards are pretty good. You know, they're not really making tokens. They're not really, you know, to make Plague Crafter bad. Uh, they have enough big must-kill targets like Kiln Fiend and even Bedlam Reveler to make Assassin's Trophies downside well worth including. Um, and that's pretty much what we're doing, and we're trimming away on some X1s to accommodate that. Two Birds of Paradise will come out. And then we're also losing some of the Game 1 cards that are just really bad in this matchup, like Hapatra and Phyrexian Revoker. So that's the play, that's the move, and our opening hand is... Pretty fine. It's another kind of unexciting one. It also doesn't cast Geist on turn two yet, which is pretty bad. But the mana's relatively painless. We do have Abrupt Decay into Plague Crafter if we can draw three lands. So hopefully we can keep the board clear, or draw a third land. So hopefully we can keep the board clear, set up like Geist into Evolution, and then after that get Court of Calling going. You know, something like that. Pwn's got turn one Soul Scar Mage. And then, and they have kept seven as well. We will main phase fetch having drawn a third land. That's pretty good. And then we're going to pass. So this gives the game away for abrupt decay, but we are playing around light up the stage. We don't want to turn on spectacle. As it turns out, the opponent's got a swifty anyway. So if they've got light up, they'll get spectacle one way or another. We wait till the last possible moment to fire our kill spell. And then of course we will hit soul scar mage and they will... Just connect for one, then they're going to pass. So no light up, which is a relief. And then it is back to us. So, you know, I think uh, the highest upside play would maybe to be to play Strangle Root Geist and hope they don't have much. So the, that next turn, if they don't have a way to remove our board and they don't have another creature, we could sack the Geist to Plague Crafter, get the back half of the Geist back, keep the Plague Crafter around, kill the opponent's creature... I, I don't think that's likely. They kept seven, right? They've got five cards in hand. They're going to draw a sixth. So I just take a clean but clunky kill trading Plague Crafter for Monastery Swifty. And kind of wasting the back half of the opponent's turn if they were holding up a removal spell, right? So all in all, I'm pretty happy with that play. But the opponent will then bolt us in the face, meaning they just drew light up the stage. Also meaning they did have a kill spell in the form of bolt that they were holding up. And they light up into Soul Scar Mage and Lightning Bolt. And since they already have the third land, this is very bad for us. It's a really scary turn. We draw Cavalier of Night. Great card in the matchup. Arguably the very best one. Um, but we just are a little bit too clunked up for it. We don't have Mana Dorks. And we have not drawn a fourth land either. So we just play Geist. Gotta hold it back, gotta try to block, gotta try to put something together next turn and stay alive in the meantime. Opponent will play the bolt from their first light up into a second light up, and they will light up into Monomorphos and crash through. And as a Mono Red Prowess player myself, I can tell you that these are some completely insane curve outs the opponent is showing us. They will Morphos, they will crash through. The floated mono will then expire, so at least they couldn't do anything with that. But they've got a huge, chunky attack here from the Soul Scar Mage, and it, it all feels pretty bad. Um, we draw fourth land, which is something we do kind of need. And then we're going to attack with a Strangle Root Geist. Definitely looks a little bit weird to attack when we're so far on the ropes, but here's why. We are going to Evo the Geist away into Yogmoth. So um, we had a couple good targets there, like Scoos would have been an okay one if we had more green available, and Kitchen Finks is a definitely a fine one right now, but the um, Yogmoth is actually low-key awesome here, because he not only represents the combo and card advantage, even though we cannot afford to pay that much life with him, we also have protection from humans. So he's just kind of like a stonewall blocker for the Soul Scar Mage. And that's a big, big deal right now. But opponent just says, okay, 
we've got a Bedlam Reveler anyway. So um, to be fair, they did have to pitch a, a, the other two Bedlam Revelers. Um, maybe they have an, a fourth one in their deck, but two of the possible three in their deck were also in their hand. So it's all clunked up a bit for the opponent, but still really, really nutty. They consider an attack, they decide against it, then they will play Soul Guide Lantern. A little bit scary for them to be representing Graveyard Hate, and then they play Kiln Fiend, they still got a card in hand. It's all pretty rough. We will simply play out some threats here. We've got uh, Garolf's Messenger coming down. We've got the client beginning to lag. And then we'll play at Birds of Paradise, we're just going to hold the line. We... Um, I, I guess, I'm sorry, I guess we cashed in the messenger, the front half of the messenger to shrink the Kiln Fiend and to try to draw a card. I was, my client was lagging, so I hit play. I don't know what order that happened in. Maybe that's what drew us the birds. I don't exactly recall. In any case, we go down to five, opponent will lava spike us, and then they'll crack Fiery Eyelid after the lava spike, and then they draw Forked Bolt for exactly lethal. So once again, hoisted on my own petard, killed both games by Forked Bolt, and hey, maybe I wouldn't have been killed if I had not um, activated Yogmoth main phase. Maybe we're supposed to wait to make sure the opponent doesn't have exactly five points of burn. Obviously, that's pretty unlikely. You know, either they're gonna kill us or not quite, but they had exactly Lava Spiked and Fork Bolt. Two sorcery speed burn spells totaling exactly five damage, punishing us for activating Yogmoth once, but the idea was to have as good of a turn last turn as possible, and then this turn we can block the human for free, we can trade the Geist for Kiln Fiend, we can chump the Bedlam Reveler, rendering their attacks potentially not that great, although of course Forked Bolt could uh, send that for a loop anyway, so again, possible we weren't supposed to activate Messenger, but are we beating that? Doesn't seem very likely to me, especially because best case scenario, we're down to one life next turn, or we've lost some creatures from the board. Don't know how it would have played out. Don't think we get there. Kind of no matter what we do here, but I could be wrong. As always, guys, you can leave your thoughts below, and I lay no claim to navigating even this relatively straightforward one uh, flawlessly. However, I do lay claim to cashing the Yogmoth League, continuing our all-positive post-Zendikar rising streak. We did kind of limp over the line to a 3-2, but Yogmoth is not like a top, top tier deck, and I was very, very new to it. Despite playing playing some practice games with it beforehand, just a steep learning curve with the deck as far as I can tell, but we cash. We do have some really cool things that we showed you in the league, but speaking of other cool things the deck can do, and speaking of my practice games that I did play, I'm going to show you a collection of scenarios now as kind of a bonus round from other uh, other scenarios I've encountered with the deck while learning it, just to show you the breadth and depth of what Yawgmoth combo is capable of. So let's take a quick look at those before we go to our wrap-up. All right, my friends, so I'm just hitting play on this match. This is game three against Rakdo Scourge, Rakdo Shadow with Luris, a top-tier deck and one that I'll be playing next on the channel. And this is just kind of a cool match all around, showing one of the strengths of Yawgmoth. So opponent keeping seven, turn one thought sees... Turn two croaks it's really strong, and R7 is strong but clunky. We've lost Wall of Roots to the Thought Seas. I pitch Cord in the face of all that depletion. Doesn't seem like it'll be online anytime soon. Uh, then we make a land drop. Opponent will play a turn three Shadow and then pass. On the end step, we will go ahead and Abrupt Decay the Shadow. Feels pretty good. Believe opponent knew about that Abrupt Decay. In any case, we've got Affection Shock here to get triple black and double green online, but we do, and we play a Garolf's Messenger. Opponent's still shocking aggressively, even in the face of the Messenger's Drain. And then they look like they thought about escaping the Kroxa, then they're just going to pass. So it is back over to us. We swing in with the Messenger, we attack for three, and then it's Eldritch Evolution time. We evolve the Messenger into another Messenger, and opponent will Lightning Bolt themselves <laughs> in response just to go out on their own terms. So we actually get a turn four kill just from Garolf's Messenger and from the opponent fetching and shocking. Now, obviously, it's very easy to look back and say that the opponent did not play that optimally, but really, I think most of what they did was really justifiable, besides maybe shocking in the final shock land on their turn four. Again, 
who knows? It looked like they were going to escape Croaks, and then they thought better of it. I'm sure they had some things to hold up, maybe like a bolt and a push or something. I don't know. But just being able to cheese out the game with the reach of Garal's Messenger, plus the, the heavy attack that the zombie can bring to bear if you ever do manage to connect with it, despite it being a slow fool with no haste that ETB's tat. Again, you can steal some games in this good old-fashioned, really grindy, but surprisingly fast way. So yeah, kind of cool turn four kill here if you ask me. And here I'll show you a blind game one from my practice games. This was one of my very first ones with the deck. And I, I keep this one in the blind, um, you know, hoping they don't have a kill spell for our birds, obviously. It's pretty good if they don't. Opponent going Fabled Passage into Island. So back over to us. And it is time for us to play Wall of Roots into Hapatra. So this is a showcase for what Hapatra can do, because it was a total non-factor in the league. Uh, the only thing it did was, like, die to a Liliana on Jund, I believe is the only thing we really did with it. Opponent then goes Mountain into Baral, Chief of Compliance. So this is Storm, um, some kind of a Storm deck anyway. I believe the opponent's on, like, a Goblin Storm deck, if I remember, maybe slightly budget or just off the beaten path. But in any case, I do tank for a while here again. This was, like, almost literally my first ever game with the deck. And then I decide on a bluff attack with Hapatra. Maybe because I tanked for a while, the opponent does decide to let it through. And then we get to go off because Hapatra is OP. So we get, um, in this situation anyway, we get to put a counter on, we get to make a snake. Second main phase, we are going to use our mana dorks to power out an eldritch evolution once i can figure out how i prefer to tap and we're going to evolve the wall of roots into yogmoth and then yogmoth gets to kill baral which as anybody can tell you who's been experienced in modern is crucial against a storm deck we get to just kill the baral which is completely insane and we get to leave a snake behind and we get to play a young wolf with our remaining mana and then we get to go off from here basically to our heart's content. I'm just going to hit play here. I lay no claim to playing this optimally, but opponent just plays a dragon fodder and says, go and look at all the stuff we're doing. We're going completely insane. This is one of my first ever games with the deck, so I, I do have a, a bit of a loop going on here, but I took me a little while to figure it out, and obviously this is going pretty crazy here. I definitely, at some point before I hit three, should have attacked. I, I even said this in the chat, I was like, well, probably shouldn't have put myself in bolt range. But in any case, we are a little bit behind the opponent on life totals, but given how many attackers we have, we end up pulling ahead when it's all said and done anyway. And uh, if, if you want to sit here and parse out the hand and say we could play a number of different ways, I'm sure that's true. But the point here is that Hapatra bluff attack set off a chain reaction where we ended up making a million snakes killing a Baral on turn three with Yawgmoth triggers and drawing a million cards along the way to a turn four kill. This is a pretty crazy advertisement for just how well Hapatra can line up in the right situation. Okay, so now we are in game two against a Titan Breach opponent that's on the play because we won game one, and they also mulligan to six. It's turn one Mystic Sanctuary, and we keep a, a bit of a risky one-lander because it has just Urborg and because it's just a one-lander, but we have double Thoughtseize and Veil of Summer, and if we draw a green land, we get to play Young Wolves too. So this is a completely nutty hand, well worth the risk in my opinion, and indeed we do get... Um, rewarded with a Twilight Mire off the top immediately, but it is turn one thought season. I decide to play the value game by taking away Snapcaster Mage, knowing that next turn um, I'll be able to thought seize my way through a remand, or indeed Veil of Summer my way through a remand. So we go ahead and float green with Twilight Mire, anticipating the remand, and then we get to Veil the remand, which is completely amazing. So we two for one them, our thought sees resolves, and I decide to continue committing to the value game by taking away Lightning Bolt. Now this might have been a mistake, because one of the only ways they can beat us, of course, is with the combo. Since we've already won the resource battle so well, um, maybe we just say, okay, sure, you can bolt something, that's fine. On the other hand, you know, 
uh, there's a reason I'm showing you this match, because we do have some interesting game against Emrakul anyway. But our deck, despite doing some amazing things so far, does stumble a bit here. No third land. Thankfully, Wall of Roots allows us to double spell anyway. Opponent shows us a land we didn't know about, so one unknown in hand, plus Island and Emmy. Uh, they will, or excuse me, we will draw the third land. And then it's just beat down time. Strangle Root Geist, move to attacks, get the clock going. And then we are just going to go Why This looks a little bit familiar, maybe, uh, relative to the um, round four of our league. Once again, we're kind of playing into the anger if they have it. That's the signal our hand is sending. But we get punished for not taking away Emrakul in a pretty big way. They do draw through the breach. They do get to breach out Emrakul. And it's all over, isn't it? Or no, it's not, because look at our deck. We go very wide, and we make stuff to throw away to Annihilator 6 like food tokens, and we've got Undying. So we're also at 16 life, so we get to go down to exactly one. We get to leave a couple lands behind, and we get to have our Undying stuff all come back. Plus, we have Eldritch Evolution in the back pocket. So the opponent with just one card in hand, and we're actually in pole position, I think, to win here. I think I, uh, you know, there might be a line with Eldritch Evolution I didn't think of. Again, this is when I was pretty new to the deck. I said, well, let's just attack. Uh, this is putting lethal on the field. Good enough for me. Now the opponent will play a land, and it's back over to us. And let's just go try to swing for that win. Unfortunately, they do cryptic command us. And then we will go for an Eldritch Evolution second main phase. So they found a Cryptic off the top to stay alive. We will Eldritch into a Zulaport Cutthroat. I don't remember what happened there. I clicked by it too quickly. Maybe did I Eldritch on the wrong creature? I'm not sure. But in any case, I'm showing you a uh, play that's maybe even more newbie than from the League. Opponent doing the amazing buyback with the Cryptic Command. Uh a Mystic Sanctuary, buying back a Cryptic Command play. So they'll Cryptic us as we move to attacks. In response, we'll Cord, looking for Scavenging Ooze to disrupt the loop, and eating that, and basically ensuring that we can get over the line one way or another, unless the opponent top decks a Lightning Bolt, which they do. So maybe we're rightfully punished. I, I don't know. I'd need to look a little bit more closer at the lines. That's not really important, because it was a tournament practice lobby game. I'm brand new to the deck at this point. We did end up winning game three, so we win the series anyway. But the point is to say how well we can recover from an Emrakul, from a breached Emrakul, from Annihilator 6. It's arguably even more impressive how we weathered that than it was how we weathered the Restore Balance in the League. So just another cool angle of attack or angle on which this deck can operate of value that people don't really account for when they're evaluating you know, their own deck, right? How often do you run into undying stuff, blowing out annihilator triggers or restore a balance? But this deck can. It's kind of cool. All right, guys. This tour would not be complete without showing you some Cavalier of Night action. So I'm dropping you in to a mono red prowess game uh, where the opponent has bolted and stomped to take care of Strangle Root Geist while a young wolf goes. Um, unopposed for the moment, and we are not doing all that much. We are pretty flooded, and it's only turn three, but that's where we're at. We do have a Yawgmoth in hand, and the opponent's got a Seasoned Pyromancer, so the opponent's having a really nice one, two, three curve. They'll pitch Firebolt and Blood Moon. More on Blood Moon in the next segment, but for now, um, those are, you know, pieces of action. I'm not sad to see them pitch. I, I do grab a forest because we have Urborg and this plays us around another Blood Moon. Just because they pitched one doesn't mean they don't value it in the matchup. They might have multiples. In any case, we do get to jam Yawgmoth here. I'm going to immediately sack a Young Wolf to beef up the Young Wolf playing around Lava Dart if they have that, killing an Elemental Token, drawing a card, and then just planning to play defense, try to get back into the game somehow. But opponent... Unfortunately, able to one for one the Yawgmoth with Flame Slash. That's a bit of a disaster. I do decide to just let it resolve. Not going to cash in my Young Wolf yet. Um, and then the opponent will play a Bone Crusher Giant. So it is back over to us. We will filter into Triple Black for Garolf's Messenger, thanks to Urborg. We'll play a Plant Token, and we are just firmly on the defensive, trying to stay alive long enough to put something together. 
but opponent ruthlessly curving out. They play a land, they'll firebolt away Young Wolf after deploying a Swifty, and then they'll put Abash into hand, plus one unknown still in hand. Definitely really, really scary. So we're just going to throw the plant underneath the uh, oversized feet of the Bone Crusher Giant, and then we draw Zulaport Cutthroat. And then we're going to bash in with Garalf's Messenger, just getting our free three points of damage in before we Evo it away. And when we Evo it away, Zulaport Cutthroat's going to drain the opponent for one, a life point swing of two, which is really relevant right now. Then Messenger is going to come back, draining them for two. And then it's Eldritch Evolution um, resolving into Cavalier of Night. Cavalier of Night, we're going to cash in the back half of Garolf's Messenger, once again draining the opponent, and we're going to tag the Bone Crusher Giant with the Cavalier's ETB. It's all pretty exciting if you ask me, especially because we leave behind a lifelinking 4-5. But as you know, the Abash deck, really hard to run out of gas, and then they have Abash into Lightning Bolt, which is just the absolute nightmare, but guess what? Cavalier of Night OP, even when it dies, it's good. So we get another drain for uh, for two with the Cutthroat, and then another ETB life loss of two from the Messenger. Opponent figuring out their attacks, will they, won't they, they end up sending in for four, and then it is back over to us, and we rip the namesake card of Yawgmoth off the top, which is just lethal. Um, no need to even dig first with Peatland. We will begin by killing a token for fun, cashing in the messenger, the opponent will be drained, and we draw Birds of Paradise, which is more fodder for the Yawgmoth combo. Synergies with Zulaport Cutthroat abound, and with Garalf's messenger, opponent makes us play it out, but that is going to do it. So Cavalier of Night, um, crucial to withstanding the Onslaught. The absolute nightmare happened after Cavalier resolved, which is that the opponent had land number six and a way to one for one our four or five lifelinker while also being able to deploy the Abash. Absolutely insane, but still the ETB killing their Bone Crusher Giant and also dying buying back the messenger enabling the loop with admittedly a very lucky draw of Yawgmoth off the top, definitely showing you why Cavalier of Night is in the deck, and that's again without it even connecting for lifelink, which a 4-5 or five lifelinker, even disregarding the other stuff at the right time, will put a lot of these games away. And now I'm just going to show you... Um, the matches I played while I was first learning the deck against awesome Patreon supporter, the Fjord, who sniped me in the tournament practice lobby. People on the Discord were hanging out, they saw me playing, and they said, well, let's go snipe the Grim Flayer, see what we can do. I'm just hitting play through these games, I'm not going to narrate them. They're, they're pretty cool back and forths, and in many ways we are definitely showing a lot of what our deck can do, but the way this first one ends is all too indicative of something I mentioned in the deck tech. So we've got some good chat banter going back and forth. I'm getting a ton of Yawgmoth value and undying value. Like, we're doing everything we want to do. We're competing with the opponent. We're accruing value in the face of one-for-one -one interaction. And it's all pretty darn good. But Fjord's got a really, really strong curve out despite all of that. And we have a really nice turn here where it's double wall of roots into Geist, but are the walls really that good? Well, I'm not sure. They're not going to help us close out the game even though we're on the front foot. And then we draw land after that. Uh, Fjord sticking in the game and chaining Spyros together, it's all pretty scary. And then can we draw anything to close out? No, we really can't. It's just good old birds of paradise. And then here is where the game is lost, where the opponent finds back-to-back -back Maguses of the Moon. And we are locked out of Yawgmoth. We can still cast Zulaport Cutthroat as long as Birds of Paradise lives, but you wouldn't think that these late-game Maguses would be all that scary. But opponent will push our Life Drainer. They will start drawing multiple cards with Cling to Dust. They will whiff on an Inquisition, and then we draw Yawgmoth, which would normally be incredible, but as always, locked out by the Blood Moon. So this is what I mean about our two-color deck losing badly to Moon. And even though we had all the chances in the world to put this game away, we whiffed for long enough that we got Mooned, and Moon locked us out pretty badly. Insult to injury, we draw triple black on the final turn before I decide to throw in the towel. 
Game two against the Fjords Rakdos. We have to mulligan against a depletion deck that's always a bit of a disaster. This is a pretty strong six, but um, opponent leading on Spellbomb is not really what we want to see. But I think dumping out the hand here makes a lot of sense. Hold up. Let's get the... Oh, I, I guess we are sp supposed to be showing the chat now. So I guess we don't see get to see the second game's chat. Sometimes the replay just won't display it, even though we have it selected. Anyway, it's back over to us. We draw another Mono Dork, so let's go for some attacks, see what the opponent's got. And it will be um, Lightning Bolt number one with the Undying Trigger on the stack. They'll bolt the second one and then cash in the Spell Bomb, so they cleanly answer everything. Spell Bomb, admittedly, still having to be cashed in without a draw, so I guess we're three for twoing them, but um, still feels pretty rough. But we do get to resolve Eldritch Evolution here. We evolve a Wall of Roots who's done its job into a Yawgmoth, and then we'll see exactly what the opponent's up to, and wouldn't you know it, it is Magus of the Moon, and they catch us without any way to finish the Magus off, because we only have one creature, we can't kill the other one, we draw Basic Swamp, but the Birds of Paradise are locked in our hands, so we're all in on Yawgmoth on them not having a kill spell for it. And wouldn't you know it, it is Liliana. Now, it's not a big surprise that the Rakdos deck has some way to kill Yawgmoth, but I'm simply not going to come back from this. That's just game. We're just kind of locked out by Magus of the Moon. We don't have any kill spells that will take care of it, besides maybe like a Plague Crafter or something. Um, and meanwhile, the Liliana has ticked down, and then we'll tick back up, getting these birds out of our hand. It's all pretty bad. Whereas if we were not mooned, we could have played a Birds of Paradise. We would have had another way to kill this creature. We would have had ways to get value or to not get edicted, not use our Liogmoth to a Liliana edict. So the point is, in some otherwise pretty even games that were actually in some ways going our way, Magus of the Moon... Um, and the Rakdos deck bringing a ton of other stuff to the table too, but Magus of the Moon really the unofficial win condition against us in both of these games, which does just go to show you that our deck is dangerously vulnerable for a two-color deck to Magus of the Moon, and again, that's kind of by necessity. We can't really afford to play more basic lands or more fetch lands to accommodate uh, moon effects um, and our ability to play around them just because we have such extreme color demands when we're trying to operate normally. So shout out to the Fjord for beating us down, mooning us out, and putting us back in our place. All right, my friends, so that was our 3-2 League debut with Yawgmoth, followed by five extra bonus matches, or at least scenarios for matches, or at least games, I should say. Five bonus games. Um, or snippets of games that kind of give you the broad Yawgmoth experience. I hope you come away with a pretty good sense of what the deck does and does not do, uh, things that it's good against, things that it is a little bit weak to, and all of the rest. I definitely made several misplays throughout this league, so please do forgive me for those. I think they're more easy to see and to explain, and also it's just easier to get through the, the content. I think this was like a borderline three-hour league when it was loaded live, and it was just I could just tell it wasn't going to be that fun to watch so I hope the replay was fun to watch I, I think it's an improvement and I think the deck's really really cool I hope you enjoyed this one um I, Yawgmoth is a, is a really strong deck. It definitely rewards mastery, that I can pretty much guarantee. And it also rewards unfamiliarity on the opponent's side. We I did see in some practice games people, you know, forgetting about Yawgmoth Pro Humans that came uh, to my aid a few times. People maybe not playing optimally around the loops or around the, the combo itself. Definitely a very complex deck with a lot of custom ability and... Is that a word? Customization potential, maybe, let's say, and a lot to like. Um, I do kind of prefer, um, a lot of people might wonder why I haven't played this before. I am kind of an archetype purist. Like, I prefer my mid-range decks to be true mid-range, and I prefer my combo decks to be true combo. So even though the hybrid nature of Yawgmoth that has... Win conditions of a combo kill and of like a mid-range value aggro plan in roughly equal proportions, that might appeal to a lot of people. Structurally, that actually doesn't appeal to me very much, and this league didn't really disabuse me of that 
notion that I that I've carried for a while. Um, so there's a structural preference I have for decks that are not like this one. But leaving that aside, the theme is really cool. The mechanics are really cool. A lot of what the deck does is really cool. I love tutoring. Um, I just like to have more interaction, frankly. That's my only real complaint about the deck. Um, and I, I think this is the optimal way to play it. But if there is a perfect world in which you could play, you could kind of like bake the combo into a more interactive shell. I think I would really, really like it then. But anyway, this was a really fun change of pace. Thank you so much to Connor Smith, the Spice Master, for making this league possible with your generous support. Thank you for working with me to decide on this 5-0 list that we just poured it over, but you know, there is still some discussion to be had. Thank you to everybody out there for watching, and thank you once again to our new and newly upgraded Patreon supporters. Um, as always, if you'd like to leave your thoughts below on the list, you can do so, but the list is not of my devising, not of our devising, it is a recent 5-0. and um, But those new Patreons and upgraded Patreons are LL Woods 89 a brand new Confidant, Nostier, upgrading from Confidant to Tireless, and Ben Rees, not Rez, Ben Rees, upgrading from Tireless all the way to Of The Veil. Really appreciate you guys, and stay tuned as the next time we go out into the modern queues, it will be at the helm of Rakdos Shadow, Rakdos Scourge, a deck rather like the one we played in the first bonus round that I just showed you at the conclusion of our league. So I'm really looking forward to that. After that, I think it's back to good old BG Rock. And from there, who knows, my friends, but I hope to see you for those videos and for all the videos to come. Thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Hope everybody out there has a wonderful day.